Call the meeting to order. Everyone, please rise for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meeting of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Cedar Grove Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be advertised by having the date, time, and place thereof posted on bulletin boards in the district, published and or transmitted to the Verona Cedar Grove Times and Star Ledger newspapers, filed with the township clerk, and posted on the district's website. May I have roll call, please? Mrs. Burke? Here. Mrs. Dye? Here. Mrs. Marinelli? Here. Mr. Mandela? Here. And Mr. Sakala? Here. Now, at this time, I would like to open the meeting for, uh, to the public for comment for items that are on the agenda. Hearing none, close that portion of the meeting. Good evening, Good board evening. members. Good, Good evening. Mr. Featherman, Ms. Tavernier. Do we have any committee reports before we get this party started, Mrs. Dunn? <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> we do, as a matter of fact. I have two. Um, last week, I attended the rec board meeting, and uh, it was actually kind of um, a solemn affair because it was the first one that we had since Ron Up had passed away. And so um, there was the empty chair, and we kind of talked about how um how, about just what a great guy he had been and and just funny stories about him and stuff so it was just it was just really kind of sad and at the same time people just you know kind of tried to make it a little more uplifting with funny tidbits but it was definitely a you know obviously a missing component there um on a much better note we welcomed our new high school rep michael slattery and basically what the um I got the right slattery, right? I said, my, okay, you're looking yeah, at me. So I'm like, all right, I just want to make sure I got the right one. I was pretty sure. And so, um, so basically what they do is um, our other rep, whose name escapes me, and I'm sorry, um, graduated. And so now we have a new one for the next two years. And so um, we told them that the meeting is generally pretty short, about 15 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes later, we were still there. So, uh, so I'm not quite sure what he's reporting back. Um, we discussed um, the pool a little bit, and um, there had been some discussions about whether or not the food service had been good in the in the year. They had thought about getting a new contract, and then we didn't. So we said more than ever, it's important to um, to reach out to the pool managers and kind of get their input for the next year. Um, we talked about Panther Park and the update of when it was going to open, um, and apparently it kind of already has because uh, football was playing on it the other day, and I know uh, football is practicing on it this evening. So um, I assume it's open. Um, and that was it. Um, and generally, the rec board meetings, for those who are interested, are the first um, Wednesday of the month at 7.30 um, in the township building. So that was a rec board meeting. Oh, and they did, I'm sorry, they did post for Ron's position. Um, it's been kind of going all around. Uh, and from what I understand, that they've got a, a lot of resumes. So I think they were looking to move quickly um, with that position. So. Uh, yesterday, I attended the middle school FSA meeting um, where Mr. DeCourt, um, who is our interim principal, um, talked about how he was uh, very grateful for the opportunity and he was very humbled. He had said he had received over 40 emails um, from parents uh, welcoming him and saying what a great job and good luck and, and all of that. Um, Erica Sloda, uh, who's the guidance counselor there, talked about how just it's such a it's the school starting with Mr. Decourt being the interim principal. It's just it's just a bright atmosphere and everybody's really positive. So that was kind of great. Um, he touched on a couple of things um, over the summer. The eighth grade, the incoming eighth grade parents had received a survey um, regarding the eighth grade trip. Typically, it's always to a rocking horse ranch, and so this year, I guess there was some talk about possibly having it um, as an overnight trip to D.C. And so I thought it was great that they actually polled the parents because the cost is kind of different. And I think it's 
like $75 to go to Rocking Horse Ranch and it's almost $400 to go to DC. Um, and out of, I think it was like 150 parents, they had 120 responses, which I thought was a great survey result. Um, and it turned out that more parents um, voted for Rocking Horse Ranch. So that's gonna continue for this year and then they may look into other options for the following year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Washington DC for one day. Yeah, it was definitely going to be a little more expensive. So, and the whole idea is they want the entire eighth grade class to be able to attend, and and so that might have made it a little cost prohibitive for some families. Um, Homework Alliance, which is uh, really big at the middle school. For those of you who don't know, it's um, it's a after school Tuesdays and Thursdays for each grade level where the students can go and they can um, get help from a teacher with their homework and they have classes and it fills up and the requirement is that you have to go on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays um, so Mr. DeCourt said that that is going to start um, people should parents should see an email towards the end of September early October and that fills up fast so for those of you who are interested I advise you to send your email right away saying you're interested because um, they will timestamp it and uh, and there's a waiting list sometimes a uh, little twist on it though which I thought is kind of good they're actually going to use members of the um, the eighth grade junior honor society to kind of act as um, they called it kind of ambassadors, but it's kind of more like tutoring in those classes um, after school, which I think is kind of great. Because right now you have one teacher and there are you know, a lot of students, and so if you kind of have the extra eighth graders for help, I think that'll be great. Um, he talked about New Jersey Ask and that they are, that we are waiting for the, um, the individual scores. And once we get those, that we would send those out to parents. We talked about conferences, um, and that again will be scheduled on Genesis, which uh, which an electronic method of doing it, which um, was a great help last year. We had a little bit of a discussion on after school clubs. Um, I know a lot of parents, especially fifth graders, have come to me and said, you know, how do you know when this starts, and how do you know when this starts, and yeah, being a parent of somebody who doesn't necessarily always get the information <laughs> coming home, um, I asked Mr. DeCord if there's a way we could kind of publicize that a little bit more, like the school newspaper or when there's play tryouts or things like that. Because um, sometimes kids don't necessarily remember to sign up or they may not have heard about the sign up even though there's a big board, I'm told, where there's you know information and there's announcements, but in the event that those don't happen. So um, he and Erica talked about uh, maybe incorporating either the Friday folder or being able to maybe have a, a new Homework Now page um, that has like you know information about clubs and stuff. And so I thought that might be kind of helpful. Um, Apparently there's a running joke about field day at the middle school, and I guess because they try to have it and then it got rained out, and, and so then they decided not to have it, and now they want to bring it back. And in all of us joking, um, we all came up with maybe a good idea is to actually have it on the, uh, at Panther Park, because you don't have to worry about rain five days before, make a little bit field trip of it, and we joked about maybe it's an, you know, an amazing race to just to get to Panther Park, so more details to follow on that. Open house for the middle school is October 2nd. Um, and what else? Oh, and traps will be here before you know it, March 15th. So, and the next meeting is October 6th. I'm done now. <laughs> it was a very informative evening, you know? Any other committee reports? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have uh, the Board of Education meeting next Tuesday, October 6th. And uh, followed by our uh, uh, ethics training with Mr. Scarillo. So um, we're going to get to all our uh, board business after that. Um, but right now we're going to call upon uh, Mrs. Matteo, Ms. Dyer to uh, come up and thrill us with our new report card system. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That's good. Oh, that's good for you, <laughs> not for me. <That's>, whoa. <laughs> There you go. I'm good. I'm good. I think you can hear me. <laughs> um, we've been working on revising the report card for K-4 for the elementary schools. And tonight we want to present to you the standards based report card and our reasoning behind it. Um, and we know that you have copies of the report card so that we'll, we'll take you through how we ended up with what you're seeing. 
Um, so a standards-based report card basically is a, well, standard-based grading is a system of reporting the student proficiency in a number of specific learning goals that are age appropriate. And those learning goals are based on our standards. So in ELA and in math, it's our common core standards. In science, social studies, and the performing arts, it is the New Jersey standards um, from 2009. The grading system is a reporting tool which helps us to communicate to the students and the parents where the student is at crucial junctures along the school year. What a standards-based grading helps the teachers to do is to focus on the learning goals of the class and also on using assessment as a tool that will be helpful in driving instruction. So the little graphic that you see on the, top, on the side kind of um, summarizes it um, in, in a really good way. We start with our standards, which is what we base all of our learning goals on. So our curriculum and instruction is driven by our standards. Once we've taught something and, and we have um, worked on those learning goals, we assess our students to try to see where they're at with those goals and then we report to both the students and the parents. So if we look at the focus of learning goals, what we wanted to be sure that the report card um, demonstrated was the content, the skills, um, the standards that the students have to know at the specific grade level. We wanted to be sure that it was not based on a cumulative grade in grades K through three, but more on mastery of those standards. We want the students to be proficient in the standards that they need to be for each grade level. Um, and from those standards, patterns start to emerge in your classroom. We start to look at the students who, through whole group and small group instruction, may need more assistance with something, or we could pull back and um, bring kids to a different level with, with where they're at at the standards. As assessment, um, we want to be sure that all work has a purpose, so everything that they're doing in, in the classroom is tied into that curriculum and to those learning goals. We want to be able to start to provide kids with a clear feedback as to where they're at. It shouldn't be a mystery to kids. Um, if, they're, if they have a specific learning goal that we want them to work on, we want them to be aware of that learning goal and to work with us on it. And it helps the students to take ownership of their, own of their own learning, and it helps the parents to understand more what their students need help with so that they can be a part of the process. The way that we started to look at the report call is we started to realize, and everything in yellow that we highlighted, that many of the um, standards that Common Core is now presenting on grade level were not reflected in the present report code that we were, lit, were, we were using because that report code was developed under the New Jersey standards. So we started to realize that there were a lot of things that we really couldn't um, we weren't teaching anymore on certain grade levels and our report card wasn't really matching Common Core. So we put a committee together of teachers in each of the buildings. There was a representative from kindergarten through fourth grade for um, both North End and South End. They came together and we started to examine report cards and standard-based report cards from all different districts. What were they doing? What were they using? What did we like? What were we comfortable with? What direction did we want to move in? And those representatives went back to their schools and to their grade level um, colleagues and really started to talk about how we could tweak the report cards that we were seeing to make it good for Cedar Grove. And so we came up with what you see in front of you today. And one of the things that we found as we were exploring standards-based report cards was that many districts were moving toward trimesters um, in the elementary school. And the reasons for that was they felt that the Common Core is so rigorous that the teachers really needed more time to help the students really master those, instruct them, master them, and then move forward with them. So for moving from a 45-day marking period to a 60-day trimester gives the students more time for, for to, to have instruction in specific skills, um, skills um, to gather the teacher to gather the data, and then for us to monitor the growth of the student. So we could really be sure that each student was um, getting to the goal that they needed to get to. 
Conferences will still be held in November. We want to be sure that we have a discussion with parents on where their kids are at in November, where they're headed, um, and then the re first report card would come out in the beginning of December. Um, it would be 60 days, so it would be December, 60 days later, March, and then June for grades one through four. Our kindergartens would retain the January, June um, marking periods. Grade four, in order to transition them to middle school, would retain the, um, the same kind of grading, the traditional A, B, C, D that they are now receiving. However, they would be sure that they were addressing the standards under Common Core ELA math and New Jersey standards for um, the other subjects in science, social studies, and the performing arts. We realize that this is a living document, what you see in front of you. Since it's going to be our first year um, using it, we want to be sure that we revisit it after this year and see where it needs to be tweaked, where we need to add things, take things away. Um, it's ever evolving um, with us. And our goal is that the elementary report card be done on Genesis, just like it is in the middle school, instead of the traditional paper copy, which we've been still using and hopefully move to the gradebook portion of Genesis also, so that hopefully we can have a portal in the grade K through four as we do in the middle school and high school. Um, Ms. Dyer is going to look at the proficiency level and how we would mark the kids. As Mrs. DiMatteo said, um, we did look at lots of different report cards that other schools were using in the area and what um, different ways they were looking at assessing students and so many of them follow a rubric or a 4321 um, way of monitoring and evaluating the students and some use different terms but these are the terms that as we went through and looked at all of our grade levels as they were working these seem to be the ones that we that stood out for us and so exceed standards, meet standards, approach the standards, and then of course does not yet meet the standards. And so I'm just going to walk you through quickly what each one of those standards basically mean. And obviously this will be important for us to not only communicate, our teachers are, of course are aware of it, but then of course communicate this to the community so they're aware of this change and they'll be ready for that when it happens. And so if a student is earning a four, which means that they're exceeding standards, what that's telling us is that they have an advanced understanding of those grade level expectations. And not only do they have that extended advanced understanding, but they're also demonstrating that consistently. And they also have initiative, they challenge themselves, they go further than just what we expect them to be able to do or know be able to do at the end of that period of time. But, and again, one thing is we want to stress is that they're demonstrating that because for example a student might be reading above grade level but if they're not demonstrating that work at school then that they might not fall into that four category or exceeding standards the next is the meeting standards and this is basically where we want our children to be this means they're proficient in this area this is really where we expect them to be at the grade level this is they're right on track, they're right where they need to be, and this is something to be celebrated for children that are meeting these standards. Approach of standards would mean they're earning a two, is saying that the child has a basic understanding of the grade level expectations, but it should indicate to you and to the parent and to the, um, to the teacher that the child might need some extra help or some reinforcement in those areas. They're not quite where they need to be to be able to understand and be able to show um, proof of how the knowledge that they have or what they can do in, res in relate as it relates to those standards. And then of course an, a one would mean that the child has minimal understanding and does not meet the grade level expectation and would be having some sort of delay as opposed according to our district standards and then of course would trigger or send a red flag that we need to be doing something a little bit differently, maybe some interventions need to be in place, maybe that child needs to go through the INRS committee, so on and so forth, so that we can make sure that that child is getting the support that they need. A few things about the proficiency level, levels that I think is important to talk about is that one of them is that the numbers are not um, indicators of linear performance. Just because a child gets a two in the first trimester doesn't necessarily mean that they're automatically going to get a three the next trimester. Um, it would just, it's, it's a natural progression of those skills that are being taught during that period of time or during that trimester. 
when we're looking at, at the Common Core, the Common Core is looking for mastery by the end of the year. And so breaking up in these trimesters, that would be their expectation of that period of time. And so it would be a new, almost a new chalkboard slate, so to speak, at that next trimester to see, because the bar would be raised and there would be more expectations at, the, at that level during that time of the year. And again, as I mentioned, the goal is mastery by the end of the year. So what kinds of things will the teachers be doing to determine those proficiency levels? Well, of course, they'll be doing their typical types, types of tests, but they'll be considering all sorts of different things. For example, how, how does this child learn best? In what way does this child communicate their learning? So they're being tested in different kinds of ways. And then also obvious evidence of student performance, work samples, their performance on activities and assessments in class, the teacher's anecdotal notes during small group instruction or whatever might else be going on, and knowledge of what that child is expected to know and be able to do by the end of the year. Our goal, of course, is to improve student achievement for all students every day in every classroom. And we also know that research supports the standards-based grading system as a basis of communication that will help children learn from what they are um, learn more effectively through better feedback. And one of the things that, as Mrs. Matteo stressed, was really getting children engaged so that they know where they are, leaving the mystery out so they should know where they're functioning, regardless of how old they are and what grade level. Okay. Thank you. Questions, thoughts, concerns? I just have a comment. Sure. I'd like to say thank you um, for this because, um, as Mrs. DiMatteo said, this is a living document because we just changed this a few years ago, um, you know, the current uh, report cards that we're using. And at that time when I saw that report card, I thought that was impressive of where we changed how we were looking at the students. Um, a far cry from when I was in elementary school and it was just, you know, did he behave, did he not behave, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, but looking at this, and I know the community doesn't see this, but um, I know that back to school is coming and um, parents will see this. I think you're going to be quite impressed of the different categories that um, the, the students will be looked at and, and how they'll be assessed. Um, this is amazing because this is real information finally for uh, parents to use and, and even teachers to, to assess. I mean, it, it's amazing how it's broken down. So thank you for going through all this because this, this is really a, a great step um, forward. Second, uh, the board, we noticed, um, was it purpose, is it purposely called a progress report um, for grades one through three and then a report card for grade four? Right. Kept it as consistent as we could. So that's what we're going to be calling it from now on for it's grades one through three is a progress report. Okay, great. To, to that question, the grading starts in fourth grade. So, yes. every, so the right. only time a student gets an A, B, C is for, in fourth grade. Right, I, I, yeah, and I that's caught what that. happens now at this point, or just well, third, third grade? grade? Third, third grade. grade, right? So it is a change for yes. third grade. Yes. It is a big change for third grade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I think this is great. So um, I'm looking for, I think the, the parents are going to be very excited about this when they see this in the next couple of weeks. So I just wanted to say thank you. This is, this is awesome. And thank you to your entire committee. We're, we're very appreciative of, of this. I think it's going to work out great. So thank you very much. Just with regards to the parent portal, what is your expectation for rolling that out? Because that's not rolling out with this. No, You're phasing not. that in, right? Well, to speak a little bit about this, it's my understanding that when evidently when we adopted Genesis in Cedar Grove, they, Genesis created the report card templates in the system. But now that we're a few years down the road, that option isn't really there, so we have to do that. That's so correct. that's what that will be, and that's the goal of getting that all inputted, so to speak. It's not probably the best way to put it. <laughs> Nevertheless, getting that into Genesis so that the teachers can do that. So it will be a process. Our goal is to have that done, um, but it's, from what I understand, it's down to the X, Y coordinates that this has to go in this box and this has to go in this box. So it, I'm sure it will be time consuming and tedious, but the goal is to have that you know, done this year. Okay. Good to have goals. I'd like to see the report really card on for December. For the first report. For the first report. Right. Right. The first paper comes out instead yes. of April. Oh. And then Great. move toward, right. Yeah. That's the process. Um. Goals. And kindergarten has always been twice, yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. 
I lost my question. Oh, no, I haven't. Um, I'm sure many parents are, are watching the board meeting and <laughs> tuning in this evening. But for those who aren't, are we going to send a letter about this home when we issue report cards or like a lot sooner or kind of what's the rollout? I believe the teachers can discuss it at back to school night. Okay. And then we're hoping to do something for parents to explain this to. Okay. Kind of a workshop. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, great. Bring it up at FSA meetings, talk about it a little bit. I'm on it. Well, let her be going home as well for parents that don't make back to school. Yeah. Great. This is awesome. Yeah. Which everyone looks at the Friday folder. Absolutely. That's your source for information. <laughs> oh, this is Thank great. you. This is Thank great. You. This really is. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute uh, break, and we'll allow anyone who wants to leave to leave. And then in a few minutes, uh, we will come back with uh, Mrs. Scarilla. For our goal setting, so don't really go anywhere. <laughs> so we're, uh, what, uh, okay, well, we'll come back with our ethics training in five minutes. Meetings adjourned for five minutes. We are uh, very happy to have our board attorney here this evening. Uh, Mr. Anthony Scarillo from Linda Berry, McCormick, Estabrook, and Cooper, PC. Yes. Uh, good, That's what it says on my card. <laughs> good evening, and um, we're happy to uh, have our uh, low ethics uh, run through, and then. Uh, happy to make that as pleasure, pleasurable as possible. Excellent. Also, <laughs> so, if you're a member of the public, Board of Education is obligated to follow the Constitution and the Code of Ethics have an annual review of appropriate behavior as board members. So we try to make this as easy as possible, and what we've attempted to do is boil this down to, for those folks who would like to take notes, to, to boil this down to um, the six C's. Um, and the first C covers the School Ethics Act, Act itself, and also covers board, the board member code of ethics. And the School Ethics Act can be found in our statute books, can be found in 18A, 12-24. And um, so that the first of the C's is the commitment that when uh, a board member becomes elected and then um, gets sworn into the Board of Education, part of their swearing in is a commitment to follow the School Ethics Act and a commitment to sign off on the Code of Ethics, that they will follow the Code of Ethics. And part of that is the disclosure form that they file, part of that is the oath of office that they sign and file. So that first piece is a commitment piece. So the first of the six C's is that as a board member, each one of these individuals will be committed to following law and code, statute and administrative code, and also, and also adhere to the Code of Ethics and the School Ethics Act. The second of the C's is the most difficult of the C's. The second of the C's is maintaining the confidentiality of the information that they get. And they get information in a confidential nature two ways. They get it through the private sessions of the Boards of Education where they deal with things that by law cannot be discussed in public. <clears throat> and then they also get it because of specific cases or specific issues that come before them, not necessarily as, as board members in uh, the private session, but maybe as board members as part of a committee. So, and, and it's a difficult issue because that's the issue that most often gets questioned by members of the public. It's most often that board members, when they're at a soccer game, or when they're at a softball game, or when they're at a football game, or they're in their local grocery store, someone will come up to them and say, you know something, I heard this about a particular teacher, what can you tell me? And by law, they can't tell you anything. There are eight areas that, um, that are confidential, and that they can't be discussed in public, and that the right to release that information doesn't reside with the members of the Board of Education. So on an annual basis, we need to review with them the fact that when they talk about things in negotiations, two of our board members are members of the negotiations committee. We will negotiate with the, represent with the representatives of your teachers association and for, with other groups in district. The information that's discussed in negotiations is confidential. The board doesn't have the ability to talk about that in public. They can talk about the final uh, memorandum agreement, but along the way, that information has to remain private. 
There are student matters, whether they are uh, regular ed student matters or special education student matters that might come to them in their role as board members. That information re is required to re be maintained in a confidential way. So they can't talk about that. So there might have been something that occurred at a, at a particular elementary school and someone from the public comes and sees them um, at a local softball game and says, you know, I heard that the students in the third grade did this. We can't, really can't talk about that. If it's come to us, we can't talk about it. We don't have that ability. We give up that right as a member of the Board of Education. Um, other, uh, other matters are things like uh, pieces of litigation, um, general right to privacy with respect to personnel matters. So there are essentially eight areas. The critical areas are student matters. The critical areas are personnel matters. The cri critical areas are um, uh, negotiations. The critical area is litigation. Those four critical areas. And then we have four other areas that are not as critical. They don't come into play as often. Um, if there is a concern about the impact of a federal regulation on the operation of the school district and they need to discuss that, they're obligated to discuss that in public and private. If they have an issue with respect to um, uh, the, we always say the disposal of a building. If there came an opportunity or, or a, a possibility, an opportunity where they were going to re recognize that a building or a piece of property that the school district owned was no longer uh, needed for school purposes, that's a discussion by law that must take place in private. So those, those are the kinds of things. So this confidentiality piece is the piece that's most difficult uh, for board members in that it's a piece that the public, not looking for them to break the law, but looking for information, having question, um, will, will pose questions to board members and they have to remind themselves that by virtue of the School Ethics Act and my Code of Ethics, that's a confidential matter and I'm not able to speak about it. And very often you'll see, an, and hopefully this doesn't come to you guys, but very often you'll see in a newspaper where there'll be a problem at a particular school district and they'll say to the superintendent or the board president, look for a comment. And the superintendent or the board president will say, um, you know, we can't comment on that. It's confidential. It's not because they don't want to comment on it. It's because by law they can't comment on it. So those are the first of the two C's. The third C is chain of command. Chain of command is the obligation of the members of the Board of Education to understand that if questions come to them with respect to a particular teacher or a protect, uh, with respect to a particular activity that might have taken place at a particular school, that they're obligated to file the chain, file, follow the chain of command, meaning they don't respond. Their, their obligation is to send policy. Their obligation is to supervise the superintendent and the business administrator, and in turn, the superintendent and the business administrator supervise the, the district and the buildings. Their obligation is to go to the superintendent and say, listen, we have a concern because this was brought to our attention. We have a concern about this particular building or this particular teacher or this particular student or this particular issue. So in the chain of command, the obligation is to not administer the schools. The obligation is to set policy for the schools. So we have now three C's. We have confidentiality, we have commitment, confidentiality, and chain of command. The fourth C is, is conflict of interest or conflict. Board members cannot act in conflict with the operation of the district. So that when the board votes by a majority to go in a particular direction on a particular issue, board members are obligated to follow that direction and not to, op not to operate in conflict with that. So they can't do things that would be in conflict with the operation of the district. They can't act in a way that would be conflict. So they can't bring litigation against the Board of Education on behalf of a child, on behalf of their child. They can't bring litigation against the Board of Education on behalf of someone else. If they were an attorney, they could not represent someone against the Board of Education. That would be acting in conflict with the, with the goals and objectives of the Board of Education. Later on, we're going to set some goals and objectives for, the, for, the, for, the, for this year. Once those goals and objectives are memorialized in writing and they're adopted by the board, the board members have taken an oath that they will follow those goals and objectives. So the, the fourth of the C's is, is, is acting in conflict, that they can act in conflict with, um, with, the, board of with the operation of the district. The fifth, of the, C, the fifth of the C's is having a claim against the Board of Education. That claim can be a financial claim. They're not allowed to take money from the Board of Education. They can be reimbursed for an expense that they might incur as part of their training. You, you may know that board members are obligated to be trained on an annual basis. And, and if that training costs, if they have to pay uh, New Jersey School Boards or whoever it is, um, $12 or $15 or $30 for that training, they can be reimbursed for that. 
but they can't be paid for their service. They can't receive money for the board of, from the Board of Education. They can't receive services for their, for their children on behalf of the Board of Education by virtue of a claim. So, uh, they can't do those kinds of things. Um, and they can't enter into businesses that might receive money uh, from the Board of Education. So if a board member, and the classic one is that if a board member was a bus driver and worked for a bus company, okay, that, that board member would not be able to drive the bus for, the, for that bus company when it drove for this particular school district because in a sense, they would be receiving money from this particular district for that job. If they owned the bus, bus company, they could not bid on a contract with this board of education because in essence, they would be receiving money from this board of education. So they can't receive, as we say, money and favors, and we think of favors as services of a particular kind. Uh, you can't have a claim against the Board of Education as a board member. So those are the five critical C's. The sixth C is, called, is, a, is complaint. Uh, a board member, uh, if there is a violation, if there's an allegation of a violation by a board member of the Code of Ethics, of the School Ethics Act, then that is resolved by virtue of a complaint to the School Ethics Commission uh, where that board member is asked to come and represent himself or herself or be represented to answer that complaint. For example, if we have a board member who uh, misses more than three bo regular consecutive board meetings on a regular, misses consecutively three regular board meetings, they can be asked, a complaint can be filed, and they can be asked to come to the School Ethics Commission and explain why they were not able to make those three regular meetings. So, um, so those are the six C's that deal with the, the Code of Ethics and the School Ethics Act. I don't know if there's questions from the board members with respect to those six items at this moment. And if you want me to, I can open it up to the public and ask them if they have questions about the interpretation of those six C's or those six items. I'll be happy to answer you're, them. You're welcome to, to, to do that if the public okay. has any questions or if the board has any questions. That mean it was pretty straightforward or I really bored you? Okay. I, I, um, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, one of the things that you talked about, which um, I hear about from different seminars I go to and even things that I've seen here on, on, on our board is um, um, you talked about how as a board member we lose certain rights. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that, about how um, as a board member or, and as a parent, um, you know, we, we may have different obligations or different, um, you know, there could be situations that arise where we're not really um, able to act as we normally would because we have taken the oath and we, you know, have been elected to the board. Yeah. There's a, there's a fairly famous case that deals with uh, First Amendment rights in school districts, and it's Tinker versus Des Moines School District, and it really goes back to the 1960s, and only Frank and I are that old, so we're the only ones who remember the 1960s. Um, <laughs> well, that came out of nowhere. That came out of nowhere, didn't it? Um, in, 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 in Tinker, um, the United States Supreme Court said that people involved in education, particularly students, but people involved in education don't leave their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door. They get to take those constitutional rights into the schoolhouse. However, as layering has taken place with respect to being elected or appointed, you know, boards of education are either elected or appointed. There are some districts in, the United, in New Jersey where board members are appointed. For example, Summit, the mayor and council on Summit appoints the board members. They're not elected. When a board member gets elected or appointed to the Board of Education and they take their own oath of office, they do park some of their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door. So they don't have the ability to speak freely. Your freedom of speech as a member of the public is significantly wider than a member of the Board of Education when it comes to issues on school, issues about um, um, school kinds of activities, whether they're financial activities, whether they're athletic activities, whatever they might be. And there are certain rights with respect to being a parent that board members park at the schoolhouse door when they become board members. And they don't have the ability to advocate on behalf of their particular child as a board member. And we always say that they step back and another parent has to advocate on behalf of their child. Now, we don't strip them of their rights, but, we, but the, the kind of the rule is that you don't have that right to do that. Nor do you have a right to, nor do board members have a right as a board member and a parent of a student who is in a particular group to come and advocate on behalf of that group 
in front of the Board of Education. The, the, rule kind of, the rule really is that you can't ask for anything on behalf of your child or the, or the group that your children are in that every other child would not have the right to get. So when a board member, for example, there's a case on rule on the record where a board member came and advocated for a change in the entrance requirements for the gifted and talented program and said that they were arguing for those changes so that every other student would have a right to get into the gifted and talented program on the changed rules. What the court says was you can't, ar you can't argue that because your child is eligible for that changed rule. So we can't separate the benefit your child's going to get from the benefit that other students are going to get on that changed rule. They said we would rule differently if your child wasn't eligible for the gifted and talented program. If your child was aged out or hadn't gotten to that age yet and was not in a period of eligibility and you came forward to argue on behalf of that particular group, then that would be appropriate. But it's not appropriate if your child is one of the children who would benefit from that. Yes? Okay, what, on that particular situation, what, what the, um, the court has said is there's really no difference between either of the two parents who come and argue on behalf of that child. And that goes back to, um, it's rooted only because we see more litigation. It's rooted really in special education. So where a parent might get on the Board of Education for some special benefit for a child who had special needs, and then said, well, my spouse or the other parent of the child is arguing what the court has said was it really doesn't matter which of the parents of the child could come forward because the child is going to get the benefit. So you can't pass the benefit, you can't pass the argument to the other, to the other parent of the child. So you have those kinds of situations and they're also no, they're really no different from a member of the Board of Education coming and arguing for a particular parent group that they might belong to. So when they sit here as a Board of Education member, um, the, con the code of conduct says you should not be sitting here as a Board of Education member and also be sitting as the president of the PTA or also be sitting as the president of the Booster Club. You could be a member of the Booster Club. You could be a member of the PTA. You could be a member of whatever the organization might be, the Educational Foundation, but you should not sit as an officer of that group while you sit as an officer of the Board of Education. The, it, it creates a, what we call a, an appearance of partiality and which places you in potential conflict with the operation of the board. And the concern that they have is that there's going to be a time when the Booster Club or the Ed Foundation goes in this direction and the board goes in this direction and then you're going to be put in a situation where the public has placed trust in you by electing you or by having you appointed to a board position and now that trust comes into question because you kind of have two different directions to go in. I don't know if I caught all of the issues there. It's, it's really the most, it's the second most difficult issue. The first most difficult issue is clearly the confidentiality. I get more calls on the confidentiality than I get on anything else. You know, we've got this issue with a parent, or we've got this issue with a teacher, or with an issue with a family, and I'm getting, questioned at the, I'm getting questioned at the pool, or I'm getting questioned on the street, and, and what can I say and what can't I say, those kinds of things. And then the second piece is, this is the organization I belong to, or my children really, you know, my children do this, you know, what, what role can I take on the Board of Education? And typically, if there's a particular benefit that's going to come to your child, we recommend that board members recuse themselves from the discussion and possibly recuse themselves from the vote. Two different things. If there's going to be a discussion about something, you recuse or you separate yourself from the discussion. If a decision is then made and you are not a participant in it, very often on a case-by-case -case basis, you can vote on the decision. But you couldn't influence the decision. We see, it, we see this most often not necessarily with children's activities, but we see it with negotiations. That um, individuals who are teachers in other districts or have spouses who are teachers in other districts or have family members that are teachers in this district can't be involved in negotiations. But when the deal is all done and the memorandum agreement signed and the salary guides are developed, depending upon the relationship, they get the right to vote on it. They can't vote on it if it brings um, financial gain to their spouse because that's in their family. But if the family member is far enough removed, if it's a niece or a nephew or a cousin, then they have the, ob they have the ability to vote on that. So we have that kind of thing. There are, I didn't want to make seven C's because areas of concern in my mind are not really one of the C's, but um, there are certain areas of concern. We're always concerned about board members' financial involvement.
both in the district and outside of the district. That's the, the area of claims that we talked about, that they can't have a financial involvement where they gain, where they gain any money. Um, the second one is the personal involvement. So we always are concerned about board members um, who have uh, children in the district or family members who are working in the district, that they, that they recuse themselves, they, they excuse themselves, they separate themselves from any discussion about those individuals. Um, the administration of the school piece is always a big piece. We talked about it in the chain of, chain of command that, board, that the public understand, and board members I know understand, that they don't administer schools. What they do is select the individual who administers the schools, who then makes recommendations to them as to who teaches in the schools and who is employed by the schools. Um, and um, um, so those are kind of like areas of concern. Um, I'm obligated as part of this training to talk about a thing that we don't really have impact us here, which is called the doctrine of necessity. If in the doctrine of necessity, if you had a board of education where um, a number of board members were conflicted on a vote with respect to the superintendent or with respect to negotiations because they had family members who were employed in the district, there's a, a document called the document of necessity. And what happens is the document of necessity is that based on the necessity that these people have to vote, these individuals have to vote, we put the conflict on the record and I issue a certification saying that I recognize that the conflicts are accurate as they are described and legitimate as they are described. And based upon my understanding of that and my understanding of the law, based under the doctrine of necessity, these individuals will be permitted to vote on the particular item. Um, we don't have that here. It doesn't come up in lots of districts. But when it does come up, it's kind of a tricky thing. And as part of the ethics training, I'm obligated to talk about it this evening. Do you, do you mean that if, for, if so many board members are conflicted out because of ties they have, then we don't have a quorum and we can't vote because there's no quorum, but this doctrine would, would allow Correct. That? That's exactly what happens. Okay. And it specifically, is, it specifically applies to personnel. So that would be the appointment of any staff member or evaluation, the evaluation of superintendent, the evaluation of the business administrator. So for example, we have a five-member board. If three of our members had spouses or children employed in the school district who were, who, who were teachers, then their direct supervision would come to, their, uh, to the superintendent because all certificated staff members are, are evaluated by the superintendent, through the building principals, to the staff members. That's called to all the direct conflict. So in that kind of situation, when we did the evaluation of the superintendent, we would only have two people who could do the evaluation of the superintendent. Based upon the doctrine of necessity, each of those three individuals would put on the record who the staff member was, what the relationship was to them, and then they acknowledged the conflict. I would then acknowledge that they were being truthful in acknowledging the conflict, and that under the doctrine of necessity, I would be then authorizing, as the attorney for the board, their ability to vote. And then once that put, is put on the record, we would then say, resolve the Board of Education upon a finding the three board members have a conflict of interest which requires the uh, invocation of the doctrine of necessity, hereby invokes the doctrine of necessity. And then they would vote, and then the next vote would be the evaluation of the superintendent. So you would take that vote right before the vote of the vote the evaluation of the superintendent, or whatever it might be. If it was a labor contract that you had to approve, you do it right before the labor contract. Um, there's um, a piece on board member indemnification. I'm required by law to talk about that a little bit tonight. There is a statute on the books that, said, that says that when board members act in their official capacity as members of the Board of Education, and they act within their job description and within the code of ethics, then any activity where there is a litigation against that individual board member or against the board as a whole, those board members are indemnified by the, by the Board of Education. And we call it the indemnification statute. And it, it arises under administrative proceedings. It arises under typical civil proceedings that you would, administrative proceedings would be a proceedings in front of the Commissioner of Education. So they would be in what we call the Office of Administrative Law. They would be in, in a civil proceeding. So it might be something that turns up um, in Essex County, at the courthouse in Essex County. In, in superior court. It might be something that turns up in a criminal nature, rare, but it does uh, from time to time turn up as a criminal in a criminal nature. That would also be superior court in, in Essex County. So in those kinds of situations, a board, the board members would be indemnified under the statute because of their role as members of the Board of Education. So that kind of talks about 
the important piece, which are the, the six C's, and kind of the ancillary pieces that fill in underneath that um, under the Code of Ethics and the um, School Ethics Act. And so if there are no questions with respect to that, we're kind of done on that, moderately painful, painless. Okay, questions? No. Okay. So the second thing that you do in conjunction with your annual ethics training um, is talk about the goals that the Board of Education may have for the uh, upcoming year. And um, as we have not prepped them in advance of this, um, there are typically um, five areas that you look at for possible goals. You, don't have have a, you do not have to have a goal in every area, but the School Ethics Act and good boardsmanship under the administrative code, which are the regulations of the Department of Education, said that you on an annual basis should take five or ten minutes to discuss all five of these issues and decide whether or not under, under any of these five issues there should be goals for the, for the <coughs> succeeding year. So um, the first of those areas is the area of communication. The Board of Education should take an opportunity for a couple of minutes to think about how it communicates to the public <coughs> and how it communicates among, among the board members to determine whether or not for the 2014-2015 school year there should be a goal with respect to communication, either changing the way something is done, um, uh, enhancing the way something is done, discontinuing the way something is done. So the first of the, the areas to just take a moment to think about is the area of communication and whether or not the board should have a, a goal for 2014, 2015 with respect to communication. Like right now? Yes. Oh, well, next month. Right. Okay. Oh, you want me to go off? I'll go no. Off the, we'll do the five. Okay, let's do yeah. all five. Really? Let's do all five. Mm -hmm. just, just, it's no. gonna take a minute. You can write down the five. Yeah, you can just down five. So we know, let's okay, okay. Down. okay. The, sec okay. the second are okay. facilities. <laughs> the second are facilities. Okay, the second are facilities. Okay, good. And the thought of facilities, is there something we should think about for 2014-15? Okay, the third one is budget. Uh, the fourth one is curriculum. And the fifth one is personnel. So those are the five areas that the Ethics Act asks you to take a look at on an annual basis at the conclusion of the review of the School Ethics Act to talk to think about uh, goals. So given those five, you don't have to have five. You should have at least one. You don't have to have five. Do we think there's anything that jumps out at you? Yes. I think so. Yeah. Lots. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. What a participatory <laughs> evening. Um, one, which one you want to grab one first? One thing that, that I think we're all referring to that jumps out at us is that um, uh, this year uh, the board has uh, talked about, uh, in terms of facili facilities, in, um, about going out for a referendum to do upgrades to our facilities. Uh, that we feel are long, uh, long needed. Um, and those type of things that we're talking about are upgrades to our, or redoing our bathrooms in the elementary schools and the high schools, and the high school. Um, redoing our high school auditorium um, to put in new seats and, and, and new lighting and new sound, because we have an unbelievable program here that suffers because of the state of our, our auditorium. Um, and uh, redoing uh, the football field to put a turf to put a turf field, and that entire complex to to make um, you know Cedar Grove competitive in, in that area because we, we really lack in, in, in that area. So those those type of things are things also that we've boilers, we've right? discussed. Did I, did I miss something? Uh, yeah. Elementary school boilers. And, oh no, well, we, we did the boilers, the, but that. what was part of well, the, what's the one the piping? The piping. The yeah. piping. Right. We put we put new boilers right. in. Uh, in South End, for example, but all the piping, maybe the pipes are this wide and you have about that much space because they're all corroded. So we need to really take out some of the old, I don't know what you call it, but I'll call it pipe. HVAC. HVAC pipes. HVAC pipes. And, and replace that so that the new boilers, which are supposed to have 30 year, 35 year lifespans, will have those lifespans and they won't conk out after. And, and run efficiently. Right. Yeah. Right. Renee, so, you, you got that, Renee? And then I'll, I'll, I'll take this information. And for the public, I'll take this information, put together the goal, and then send it back to Mr. Sakala to share with the board members, and then they'll vote on it probably at the next board meeting and adopt those as the goals for 2014-2015. That sounds like a pretty ambitious goal. We're ambitious. 
You are ambitious. Well, what, we, what we've been looking at is um, sort of a, um, a five-year plan in facilities um, and trying to, uh, and last year, um, or is it two years now? It'll be two years by the next one. Uh, we did the roofs, windows, um, doors. Um, you know, those were really needed at that time. So we're looking, I mean, you're talking about facilities that are 50, 60 years old. So we're trying to, um, you know, do a little at a time um, without really falling behind where, where we, you know, some of them are safety issues. You know, the piping and stuff are safety issues. Bathrooms are safety issues. You know, um, even, our, even our facility, the bleachers and stuff, you know, we've had, you know, in the past, we've run into problems with even uh, lawsuits against us, you know. So it's things that have been neglected that really can't be neglected any longer. We really need to look at these things for safety issues in a lot of areas. So, with res uh, so maybe this just segues into the budget issue. Is there a special budget besides the referendum? Is there, is there any other special budgetary issue component of this piece for uh, capital reserve or anything like that, Renee? That you know of is, or this is all going to be done under the referendum. <laughs> So there wouldn't be a need really for a budget goal if it's all being done on the referendum. It'll all work out together. Okay. We always have budget goals. Well, yeah, Our goal well, is always to keep it within two percent. Well, that yeah, and that's kind of a that that's that generally doesn't become a budget because it's a statutory obligation for the public. They have a statutory obligation to keep the budget within a two percent cap. So ha having a budgetary, we don't generally have a budgetary goal because you have a statutory obligation which is greater than any board goal you could have. No, but it has been recommended that the board go above that 2% cap by some community members and we choose not, I mean, that's one of our goals is based that we don't. On, based on those areas that you can get the, um, the waiver. Right. right. Mm -hmm. so. Then maybe we should make that, this as a budget that, goal. Um, because we don't, we try not to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe Maybe we'll put something together and you can decide whether or not it's something you want to adopt as part right, of it. I definitely think we should at least talk about it, have yeah. it, and then discuss it if we want to have yeah. it as a goal. Okay. Um, curriculum? Well, you know, what we did last year, because with curriculum and, and um, personnel, because we were kind of focusing on trying to stay within three goals, was didn't we do like student achievement and we rolled kind of the professional development, yeah, we kind of all have like a the legislation a of, um, changes, and so. curriculum and instruction all into one. So we didn't have more goals, but we had more, I guess, deeper goals. But I think one of the focuses that we really should focus on with the Common Core is curriculum. Yeah, I think curriculum and stands out more this year, year than yeah. others. No, no, I don't disagree. That's yeah, and I think we really need to take a look at where our curriculum is, especially with the Common Core. You know, science standards might be coming too. The alignment. We need to align, right, line, and I think that curriculum is going to be, or should be, a major focus. And I when agree. you get the curriculum in alignment, um, then, you know, the other students fall in. Yeah. Right. I agree. Okay. Yeah. But right. you, yep. I mean, that's yep. the core of your teaching is your curriculum, and I think that needs to be really focused on over the next year. Okay. Absolutely. We'll do that as one, mm -hmm. and then you guys can wordsmith it after it's written if it doesn't work out right. Um, Communication has always been one of our goals, um, we, and I think we need to continue that there. I think that um, there was a time uh, where uh, there was no, com it was very minimal communication, and then I believe there was a time when we really oversaturated with <laughs> communication, and I feel now we're at an area where we've, we've not become complacent, but I think, um, thankfully, the last few years, things, the board has been uh, doing things, um, there hasn't been anything that's that's standing out where it's an issue. And I think that when something becomes an issue, that's when we feel that we have to communicate better. And I think that we've become complacent, and I think this is just my own opinion, I think we need to go back to um, maybe putting out our monthly reports from the board um, when we did it through mm -hmm. the Verona Cedar Grove mm -hmm. Times, mm -hmm. and just keep the public informed of really what we're doing and what we're thinking about or what we're working on because we, we, like I said, we're a part of it and we live it every day, but the community doesn't. And I think that we need to make them aware of our accomplishments, our goal, you know, not just the goals now, but in general what we're working on. And I think maybe if we go back to a monthly report out to the community, um, 
you know, in, in different venues, through the newspapers, through the Friday folders, every way we can just put the same message out there on a monthly basis. And we could do it collaboratively and, and work that, but I think that's something we should go back towards. You know, we focused on a lot of the communication come from the administration over the last couple of years, but I think we need to go back to the voice of the board and, and what's going on. I don't know what your feeling is there, but I've That's been thinking about that. Okay. Right, and I think part of that is is because um, you know all of us here are so involved in the schools every day. You know whether it's through sports or through class moms or through P, um, you know the, the the different associations, and we're so out there. Sometimes we. You know, and we're talking to so many different people. Sometimes we forget, you know, the bigger picture, a bigger picture beyond right. our own, you know, our own worlds that I mean, we all function with. It's still within the school, but that seems like it would be more of a board goal. I mean, are we are we setting yeah. district goals and yeah. board goals? Well, are we it, setting no, it could be a, it could be a board goal or district yeah, goal. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. no, that's good. Sense. That that's and that's really a fairly common one, and particularly for that reason, Laura, because particularly board members tend to be involved in a lot of stuff and. They have to step out of that to, to make sure everyone else gets the information that they get on a regular basis. So. And that's, I'm glad you worded it that way, because that was my point. Like, I feel like we, we are to all to touched <laughs> in different areas, and maybe that's why we didn't need to do that. And I, I feel like we, we were missing the big, the, uh, there's more people than just what we're touching every day. So, yeah, that's exactly. Okay. The last area was the area of personnel. And I know you're... And I know just from the past that you're constantly looking at this area, but I don't know if there was something in particular that either through a recommendation from the superintendent or a recommendation from yourselves over the course of the year that there was some area in personnel that you needed to look at to... Um, Secure the high school, high school principal. I mean, is that really, you know, is that, would that go to go? No, because I think like in the past, like the area we, we wanted to secure were supervisors in language arts and math. Does We've that, done is that. that. Mm -hmm. is that replacing that an existing position. But replacing position. an existing yeah. is not really. Not right. Right. Mr. Featherman, do you have any idea? Not particularly. We've done well this year to get a couple of extra positions. We're not talking about a specific teacher going. No, 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 no. Overall. Just an area. Overall. Like the creation of a new. Right, a new. No, like a couple of years ago, like I said, we didn't have Well, yeah, the supervisor, yeah, yeah the creation in. of supervisor right. position, no, that didn't. kind of thing. No, right. I don't think no, so. Not, not in that area this year. I think that the main, the main I focus is, you know, the, the referendum and the curriculum. It sounds like it. The, and referendum the curriculum. and curriculum. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're equally important, mm -hmm. and um, it, I think that they need to be our, our main, our main focus. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and those two alone, given the, um, the the scope, it's going to be very time consuming. You know, there's a lot that's going to go into. And it's going to stress. And it's going to test your communication because a piece <laughs> yes. of that is going to be communication. Yeah, absolutely. And a communicating the goal of, of the referendum out to the members of the public. So when it comes to a vote, all that information is out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you know, so that'll all be there. So does that become a third, or is that just a function of the first two? No, I that communication, well, you two separate pieces of communication, because Frank really talked about expanding and looking at communication on, our, on an, so on an ongoing basis, standalone. but you're yeah. going to have communication with respect to facilities and the mm -hmm. referendum. It's going to so sit, so in gonna sit right. inside that goal. So that yeah. really kind of be It'll be a, you'll have some, this will be a board goal, the communication. you'll have some component of a referendum, which will be public relations. You'll either have someone from the bonding company or someone who's involved in that, working with you on communication, making sure you hold the appropriate meetings district-wide and that you, you get out and talk about the referendum. And you allow the public to provide feedback to you on the referendum so you don't miss something along the way. Okay. Renee took really good notes because I was watching. So it's really a lot. She's written she down a lot. She didn't come up for air. <laughs> so I put her to work without giving her a warning. So, um, Unless there's something else, that's it. So, so now what happens? You write up. I'm going to write up the uh, the goals, and I'm going to send them to Mr. Sakala and to Mr. Featherman, so that they can share them with you, <coughs> and then you can play with it a little. And we can have a conversation, whatever it is. Then they come back for adoption by you. What would be the time frame on the yeah. adoption by us? Uh, potentially your next board meeting. Yeah. 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 Potentially your next board meeting if we can. 
and then back to kind of the ethics things. How did the goals guide us over the year? Like, how did they? So since we voted on them, we can't midstream change something. We can't say mm -hmm. we can't hold Mr. Featherman accountable for something other than those goals. How does that work? Like with um, okay, you can't know. You cannot when once you mention, there's goals. Once, with any of these, with the goals, with our goals, right. when we evaluate Mr. Featherman at the end of the year, it's related to the goals. Correct. So we can't evaluate him on anything other than these goals? Only on the job description? His goals, right? His, his no, goals. These, no, these, no, no, there, there's, there's, there's several there's areas of evaluation. Right. One is the job, his job description. So right. you can evaluate based on his job description. The second piece is you can evaluate based on his merit goals. Yeah, right. Right. Third piece right. is you can evaluate based on your board goals right. or district goals. Right. But once they're set, you can't create new ones along the way right. to evaluate him. Right. We can't Correct. add to this when we no. go to evaluate. Him. Once you say, hey, once you adopt you them, you didn't do it. once you adopt them by board vote, you can abandon them, but you can't add to them. Gotcha. So you can say, you know what, we're not going to get to uh, curriculum, or we're not going to get to where well, you didn't have personnel. We're not going to get to the personnel one. You can do that. You can you can abandon the goal, but you can't come up with another one. To, to do an evaluation based on that with Mr. Featherman or with the business administrator. And, and we're not obviously not evaluating the superintendent on a board goal that we set because that's not his. Correct. Right. So we, only his component only piece of that which would fit into his job description or his, his evaluation. Does that, does that fall under that? Where does QSOC fall in? Well, or even goal. student scores like so what, what we're saying is is things outside measurements where um, where we sit with outside measurements they could be okay. exact they could be if you if tests, you have they could be SATs if we want to hold the administration accountable for those results where do we you need to set that in? as part of the administration's merit goals so that's got to be in merit goals it can't be in these goals you can't unless no these are really yours okay they really can't be okay unless you have a goal that dovetails back into a merit goal. It has to be merit goal based for mm -hmm. so our okay. so those goals are only based on these five. Correct. Five yes, your board goals are only based on these five things. Um, Although it does, I mean, it, it does touch because if we're going to make our goal uh, a curriculum goal, and do we want to become aligned with the Common Core, and that's been one of the the, the there may the be a piece of that. that there may be a piece of that that becomes a superintendent's responsibility. Then certainly you can evaluate the superintendent on that. But um, but if it's not part of his responsibility, then it wouldn't fall under an, uh, you wouldn't fall under a piece that he could be evaluated on. But so Common Common Core um, QSAC QSAC um, Middle States Middle States Middle Park testing all that stuff. Right. They really do fall under his jurisdiction as part of his evaluation to a degree, not 100%, because he doesn't have 100% responsibility right. in every one of those. Right. But, but those would that fall under the curriculum portion of this? Might not. Would fall under his own evaluation. So, you But that's back. our question. Is it under his evaluations for merit or under evaluations for, for goals? Because like how we used to do it in the past, like and maybe we did it wrong, but there would be, we would have goals right. and I remember there we would Improving differentiate student. superintendent goals right. and then board goals here it sounds like we were these are more board goals so if you differentiate a piece of this and make it a superintendent's goal you can do that that right. that's, that's what, like how would curriculum be a right. board goal right how and would not we... a superintendent goal well you're you're going to direct that the superintendent and the supervisors um, align the curriculum let's say i just picked one align the curriculum to the common core common core and then demonstrate that alignment back to you then you could evaluate them on their ability to align it and whether or not it got aligned so that would be in the wording that we get back right. and correct so we want that in there. yeah we want yeah. that in there and also right. cusack alignment as well okay there. we can do that okay we're yeah. adhering to cusack yeah, it's really more adhering to QSEC, not yeah. QSEC alignment. Well, not alignment, right. but yeah. being approved. That's what the terminology approved. under curriculum we want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Say that again. You said the, the, <laughs> the language under curriculum um, that we want. That's what you um, said, right? Oh, what I said. The language. Renee's right. The, the alignment, of, alignment of the Common Core. Alignment, alignment of the curriculum common with the Common Core. core and 
alignment to QSAC. Not alignment requirements to the QSAC. No, adhering meeting QSAC requirements. Adhering to the recommendations of of. Well, yeah. yeah, you yeah. pass, you meet. The Department, with Department of Education, yeah, yeah, it's Department of Education's right. goals and QSAC, or standards, right. standards. meeting the standards. Right. Yeah, so you have to look at the QSAC, QSAC document QSAC. to come up with the, right. the words to put in there. Well, I think that's what we're, we're, we want to focus on, on the curriculum aspect of it. Okay. We want to make sure that that's But that's a result of the curriculum. Yes, it's, it's a subset of curriculum. Right, right. So but I think where you were going, I'll let right. Joe finish his thought okay. because right. I think where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think I think that as part of, of the goal that we want to set for uh, the district and, and therefore the superintendent is that um, we become aligned with the Common Core as Required by the state, the, you know, the and you successfully meet the standards, yeah. the standards of QSAC. Right. The use, yeah. That when you go through the QSAC monitoring, that mm -hmm. you are successful yeah. in that yeah. monitoring. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you got two pieces there: um, the, all of it. the Common right. Core alignment and the QSAC yeah. monitoring. Right. Yes. Thank yep. you. Okay. Because really, QSAC is a monitoring process right. to assess your ability to meet the standards set forth there. Mm -hmm. Good, all right. And by aligning to the common core, the QSAC will just drop out. Right. Because that was our one area. Right. Okay. Good. All right? Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I'll see you guys right. shortly. Good seeing you. <laughs> great. As always, thanks for your time. Yeah, sure. Since no one down in Trenton wants to be bothered oh. with us anymore. <laughs> Yes, I did say that live. <laughs> yes, I did say that live. But I felt like he really kind of explained things a little bit better. Right? Much better. Right. I mean, we had an idea and he articulated it in a, in a nice way. Much yes. better. No, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scrillo. We actually have an agenda now, right? Yeah, we have a nice full agenda. Okay. Moving on the agenda under minutes. Under uh, B1, may I have a motion for B1 and B2, which uh, B1 is a motion to approve the public and executive minutes of August 26, 2014, and B2 is a motion to approve the board secretary certification to the Board of Ed that no line item account has encumbrances and expenditures which exceed the line item appropriation in violation of the New Jersey Administrative Code. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any comment? Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Guy? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mrs. Aye. And Mr. Sakawa? Yes. Under business, may I have a motion for B3? B3 is a resolution, um, which is an extension of a prior uh, uh, agreement with the uh, Cedar Grove Custodial Association uh, for one of their, um, one of our custodians to uh, have a change in their work day or as a result of a, a travel uh, a travel conflict. I'm not going to read the whole resolution. It's there in B3. May I have a motion for that item, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. And Mr. Sakala? Yes. Under personnel? May I have a motion for items S1 through S9? To break that in half. Uh, S1 is a motion to rescind the appointment of Rosemary DeRose as lunch aide at South End. S2 is a motion to approve Rose Romundo as lunch aide at South End. S3 is a motion to accept the resignation of Laura Splendoria as lunch for lunch aide at South End. S4 is a motion to rescind the appointment of Wendy Hendricks Ruddy, paraprofessional at North End. S5 is a motion to rescind the appointment of, an, of Antoinette Cusimano, professional at North End School, a uh, paraprofessional at North End School, excuse me. S6 is a motion to rescind the retirement of Michael Negri as high school custodian um, from September 4th and change it to September 1st. S7 is a motion to approve Robert Zoppi as senior network technician at the uh, salary prorated 
uh, set forth therein. S8 is a motion to appoint David Robertson Robinson as part-time custodian at South End for the rate set forth therein. And S9 is a motion to approve Valentino Salerno as high school night custodian uh, for at the step and, and rate set forth therein. May I have a motion for those items, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. And Mr. Sakella? Yes. Um, may I have a motion for S10 through S18? S10 is a, a motion to, I'm sorry, yeah, S10. Is a motion to authorize attendance at the events listed therein. S11 is a motion to approve the leave of absences as set forth therein. S12 is a motion to approve the students, the student set forth in that motion for classroom observation. S13 is a motion to retroactively approve guided summer work at a per diem rate as set forth therein. S14 is a motion to reimburse the school-based volunteer as set forth in that item. S15 is a motion to approve uh, a school-based volunteer as set forth therein. S16 is a motion to approve employees at $30 an hour for home instruction and supplemental instruction, and they are set forth in that item. S18 is a motion to approve afternoon lunch duty stipend at North End for the employees set forth therein. And S18 is a motion to rescind Linda, Le Le Linda Letty as afternoon lunch duty stipend at North End for the school year. May I have a motion for those items, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? May I have roll call, please? Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. And Mr. Sakala? Yes. Under curriculum, I have a motion for S19, which is a motion to retroactively approve Randy Nelson to complete phase three curriculum writing in health, grades five through eight for this school year at the curriculum rate. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. Mr. Yes. Uh, under contracts, we have a motion for S20, and that's a motion to approve the contract as set forth in that item uh, for special education students as recommended by the Director of Special Services. So, mo so moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. And Mr. Sakala? Yes. Okay, we are at the portion of the meeting where Mr. Featherman is going to discuss with us some new uh, and amended policy uh, and regulations. And um, after he reviews them, uh, I guess Mr. Featherman will explain what the procedure is going to be following that. Thank you, Mr. Sakala. Good evening, everyone. There are several policy and regulation updates most of which are mandatory. What I will do is briefly read for you the policy updates. I've sort of distilled them down into uh, consumable parts. Uh, a lot of these policies and regs are extensive, so between now and our next board meeting, uh, the policy committee will meet and fill in some of the blanks as they relate to these policies and regulations. At the next meeting, we will have our second reading, and at that time, hopefully approve all of these changes. So between now and then, public input is welcomed. Let's start with policy 2412, home instruction due to health condition. It's a revised policy. This policy was readopted with several minor revisions and several significant revisions. The new code eliminates the requirement that teacher, teacher providing home instruction must be certified for the subject, grade level, and or special need of the student. That is, that eliminates that requirement. The new code only requires that the teacher be a certified one. Secondly, the new code eliminates the number of required instruction hours for a student on home instruction due to a temporary or chronic health condition. Policy and Reg 2417. The establishment of intervention and referral services was readopted with minor revisions. 
The revisions in the readoption are mostly language changes that will have little impact on how a school's INRS team functions. <coughs> 2481, home or out of school instruction for a general ed student for reasons other than a temporary or chronic health condition. Again, this is a revision. It was readopted with several minor revisions and one significant revision. This administrative code section, policy, and regulation covers the student who is not temporarily out of school due to health, but due to waiting for placement in an alternate education program suspended more than five days or that is court ordered to receive instructional services at home or other out of school setting. The home instruction hours and number of times per week did not change. However, the teacher only needs to be certified and not required to be certified in the subject grade or special needs area of the student. Policy 3283 and 4283. Electronic communications between teaching staff members and students, and electronic communications between support staff members and students, both of which are new. Public Law 2014, Chapter 2, S441, was approved and requires every school district to adopt a written policy concerning electronic communications between school employees and students enrolled in the district. The policy shall include at a minimum, provisions designed to prevent, quote, improper communications between school employees and students via email, cellular telephones, social networking sites, and other internet-based media. The new statute, which is only two paragraphs long, does not define improper and requires each school district to do so. As such, I recommend, as Strauss SMA does, we define improper electronic communications, close quote, as communications where, this, where the content of the communication is inappropriate and or the manner in which the electronic communication is made is not in accordance with the acceptable protocols as defined in this policy. These policy guides provide two options for an exemption from the policy for staff members and students who share a family relationship. Policy Guide 4283 prohibits all electronic communications between support staff members and students, but has a provision where the superintendent or designee may grant an exemption from the policy if it is determined that the support staff member's professional responsibilities should permit such communications subject to the same requirements as teaching staff members. Moving on, Policy 5200, Attendance. Attendance was recodified in administrative code and readopted with several significant changes. Policy Guide 5200 has been revised to incorporate the revisions in the readopted code. The most significant changes are in the revised regulation guide 5200. They created a new section B concerning attendance recording. This is a complex change, so I've again distilled it down. Uh, give you, uh, uh, we'll provide access to a more comprehensive understanding of the change in the attendance policy after the committee has met and we've gotten input from specifically the high school. The new code for practical purposes establishes three types of absences. Excused absences, unexcused absences that count towards truancy, and unexcused absences that do not count towards truancy. The DOE has indicated the only excused absences are absences for observance of religious holidays and take your child to work day, as excused by the DOE. A district determines unexcused absences that do not count towards truancy. With all other unexcused absences considered unexcused that count towards truancy. Now in section C, what the board and I will do, or at least the policy committee, is determine which of those absences count for that category. That is, they're unexcused absences but don't count towards truancy. Obviously, religious holidays count, but it may be a child going for his or her driver's license, uh, et cetera. Death in the family. Right. 5610, suspension. Short-term suspensions and administrative code, long-term suspensions, were readopted with minor revisions. Provisions related to suspensions of students due to firearm offenses and assaults were moved from this policy 
as these are addressed in the policy that I'll reintroduce to you in a moment. Policy 5611, removal of students for firearms offenses. Removal of students for firearm offenses was readopted with minor revisions. Policy and Reg Guide 5611 concerns students who are convicted of possessing a firearm on school grounds, commit a crime in possession of a firearm on school property, or knowingly possess a firearm on school grounds. Policy 5612 and Reg 5612, assaults on District Board of Education members or employees. Assaults on District Board of Education members or employees was readopted with minor revisions. Policy and Reg Guide 5612 concerns students who assault board members or school employees not involving the use of a weapon or firearm. The existing Policy Guide 5612 has been revised with additional language included in the Administrative Code. Policy Guide 5612 did not have a corresponding regulation guide. However, a new regulation guide, 5612, has been developed that aligns with the requirements of Administrative Code. 5613, removal of students for assaults with weapons offenses. This is new. Policy and Regulation Guide 5613 concerns students who assault a teacher, administrator, school employee, board member, or other student on school grounds with a weapon except a firearm. These provisions were previously included in Policy and Reg 5611, <coughs> but are now addressed in this new Policy and Reg. 5620, Expulsion. This is a revision. Expulsion was recodified by Administrative Code and readopted with minor revisions. A Board of Education may expel a general education student from school, but the Board is still required to provide an alternate education program until the child's 20th birthday. And lastly, Policy 8462, reporting potentially missing or abused children. This is a revision. Policy and Reg Guide 8462 has been revised to incorporate these minor changes. Regulation Guide 8462 must be adopted by the Board as required by Administrative Code. And so we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Featherman. So my understanding is that we will approve these on first reading. They'll be tinkered with or amended, and then we'll, the revised will be, will be uh, voted on for second reading. Is that how it works? Or well, maybe we should have a discussion. I would rather see us done what we've done, and that is read them through for first reading and let the policy committee meet with myself and declare the, the specifics in those policy and regs that haven't been declared yet. Again, specifically, the, declaring which days count for unexcused and not towards truancy and so forth, then on second read, officially adopt them. And between now and then, we welcome public uh, comment tonight or so we, I, 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 I that's what my understanding was, yeah. but now in terms of the motion to approve it on first reading, even though we don't have those gaps filled in, is it? Is I, it I'd, okay? rather, I'd rather, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd, I'd rather not approve it on first reading, given the fact that I think there's still healthy conversation that has to go on. So we'll, we'll on with we, we won't act on S21 tonight, and we'll put it on for first reading, for approval on first reading after the policy committee meets. I think that would right. be my recommendation. But then time. we would need to have a second reading yeah. on it. Right. right. So this wouldn't get approved until the end of October. No, October 7th. October 7th. Yeah, right. On the 23rd. Oh, right. First right, right, right. right. October 7th. Yeah. Right. right. Is, that, is that okay? I mean, I, I, I mean it's okay. Is that, do we have any right. time, time constraints to adopt these? Well, they need to be adopted as soon as possible, but I, I don't want to be um, impetuous and do so without, you know, thinking through the particulars on a number of these policies. No, but is there any state deadlines that we have to meet? No imposed specific deadline, no, but, okay. you know, as soon as is possible for the 14-15 school year. Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll table S21 for... You know, actually, I didn't realize that... I think the answer to that is yes. Not realizing what first read and second read entails, I would rather have it been approved formally at the next board meeting. But we having can't. said that, I'm not comfortable doing that given what we have yet to sort of resolve. So I think yes is the answer. We, we, we put it off until the next meeting and formally approve it at the October 7th meeting. I'd like okay. to see it that way if that's okay. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Absolutely. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Featherman. Uh, the meeting is open to the public for comment for items on or off the agenda. Hearing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. Board, member ha board members have any final comments? Anything you want to add? No? This okay. was our first meeting since school opened, right? Yes. Correct. Oh, so then I do want to make a comment. I just I lose track of time. I just want to say thank you to all the administration um, for, um, I mean, I understand the first day of school uh, went extremely, why, well, you didn't no, hear that? first day of school was rough. Oh, but it went well. No, I heard it went extremely well, um, all the buildings and, um, you know, I, I just wanted to thank everyone um, in the administration, principals, vice principals. I, I mean, it it, um, it was a really uh, smooth, no big tragedies, thank God, or anything happening. So thank you for a great start to another school year and um, looking forward to all good things. So thank you. Thank you. And remember, community uh, open houses starting. Um, the next couple weeks through October 2nd, right? Was the last one? Right. So, check yeah, check your Friday check folders. Friday. <laughs> okay, announcements of future meetings. Uh, September 23rd, um, uh, 2014, here in the North End Media Center, 7 p.m. for executive session, 8 p.m. for a regular meeting. And then the following meeting after that, October 7th, 2014, here in the North End Media Center. Uh, 7 p.m. for executive session, 8 p.m. for the regular meeting. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Dye? Yes. Mrs. Marinelli? Aye. Mr. Mandela? Aye. And Mr. Sakala? Yes. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>